Joanna Bryson, welcome to How the Light Gets In. Oh, thank you. So we talked about this a bit earlier. You started out studying behavioral sciences. You later switched to psychology. How does AI fit in all these uh, other interests of yours? Well, uh, my first, my initial interest when I was a child was actually, well, dinosaurs. But after that, <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, animal behavior. I was a big fan of Jane Goodall. Um, and I wanted to know in general why were different species uh, using intelligence in different ways. Of course, I was also interested in people. Why do different people use intelligence in different ways? And why do individual people use intelligence in different ways at different times? You all know, we all know that sometimes mm. we think and sometimes we don't. But I also figured out that if you study people, everyone tells you you're wrong. <laughs> so I, I thought, let's get the animals down first. And that was really, really hard to study. There's no courses in animal behavior. I mean, now there sort of is, it's called behavioral ecology. But anyway, at that time at University of Chicago, non-clinical psychology was called um, behavioral science. And so I was able, it's a liberal arts degree, I was also able to take biology, um, biological basis of behavior, classes like that. And um, so artificial intelligence, I was a science fiction fan <laughs> I, right. since, since I was first forced to read it as, a, again, in middle school, it's like you have to try one of everything. And mm -hmm. like, whoa, this is me, you know? So uh, of course it was an interest anyway. But I started to realize that it was a means by which you could, um, you could start modeling and understanding the theories. You could really uh, do science in a different way if you build the theory and see if it's coherent, right? So it doesn't, it's just like the rest of science. It doesn't necessarily prove you're right, but it increases the probability you're right. So I uh, went into artificial intelligence partly because I enjoyed the idea of trying to make machines smart, and partly because I wanted to continue doing the science and I knew I was a really good programmer and those were sort of thin on the ground. Mm. And so it was sort of a safety for me. If, mm. I, if, I'd, if I'd had a little more courage, I might've just stuck straight in like neuroscience or something like that. But I'm glad I did. I'm, I'm really glad I went into artificial intelligence. So as you said, you, you got interested in artificial intelligence through science fiction. Of yeah. course, those are the kind of main accounts a lot of us are familiar with. Yeah. And when it comes to fictionalized accounts of AI, they're always a bit scary, right? We have like, you know, the Terminator, films like Ex Machina. Do you think these fears are misplaced? Is there sort of is science fiction a kind of uh, format sort of misunderstanding AI rather than understanding what it really is? Okay, well, I'm gonna have to disagree with you because uh, they're not always negative. Sometimes they're overly positive. So you have data as a super being in Star Trek, right? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, in fact, you have the computer in Star Trek and HAL, and the, the, these uh, spaceships that are, that are in cognizant in some sense, although it's interesting that they don't talk much about the cognizance of, of the Enterprise, but they do, of course, with HAL. It's like definitely this, this being that could even be uh, 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 suffer some form of breakdown. Mm -hmm. um, so both of these, I would say, is a problem. It's a problem called anthropomorphism. Yeah. So the belief that becoming more intelligent makes you more like a human. Just mm. like becoming taller makes you more like a giraffe, right? It's, it, it, right. Th this is a, a fundamental flaw and it's a particularly problematic one because we, our, our entire mode of being, our entire survival basis is social. So if we misattribute what is and isn't a person, then we're in trouble. And, and this is actually a conversation I was just having with one of the other speakers here. I don't believe you can form justice and trust without peers. And so this is one of the problems that we're suffering now with these increasing levels of inequality too, mm. that humans aren't even always peers to each other. Uh, or at, at, no one's perfect peers, of course, but, but adequately able to uh, uh, call each other to account. Interesting. But with a, with a technology, with something you've actually designed, someone is buying and selling and designing AI, then there's no way that's a peer, right? It's actually uh, worse, worse than slavery. It's yeah. not only owned, it's designed. I mean, is it possible that AI does acquire sociability, at least between other artificial intelligent machines, if not between AI machines and humans? Okay, so here we go again with the, uh, the, the, the idea about acquiring is really interesting. Mm. Because as I just said, it's designed, right? So even if uh, a system changes over time because it's got machine learning built into it, now in real life, <laughs> the machine learning usually is used during the development phase and is no longer used in production. So when you get to play with the AI, it's not actually learning, except in very carefully specified ways. Like mm. you know, it can learn your name, it might be, maybe it can learn the layout of your house, 
if it's a vacuum cleaner, most of these robot vacuum cleaners don't learn the layout of your house. They just bump around, right? right? But even if you had that, even if you as a company sat down and said, I'm going to produce this product that really is going to develop and change, that is still the responsibility of the corporation. So that, okay, so that was about, will, will AI itself acquire? Yeah, That's will we a, design that, that you it? Yeah. Think, yeah, so now the question, but it, so morally that changes a lot. Mm. We, we may design it that way. Um, and I think what's worse is that um, people may choose to market it in such a way that it is given legal personality, even though it is actually an extension of a corporation or a government or some other powerful individual, mm. right? So uh, it's literally buying votes, right? There, there's this idea, there, there's, again, complete disinformation that Sophia the Robot is a citizen of Saudi Arabia. It was never true. Um, it was made a uh, honorary citizen. I mean, there are so many constraints about being a citizen of Saudi Arabia that Sophia the Robot doesn't make. You have to be at least Muslim, but it's not sufficient to be Muslim, but you have to at least be Muslim to be a citizen of Saudi Arabia, right? So the, um, there's, a, yeah, there's a lot of fictions that are and disinformation spread, and so what I'm worried about is there may very well be artificial intelligence that is given uh, uh, these kinds of legal powers and that is just going to be an entryway, a vector into a serious corruption of our justice system. So why, we'll get to the ethical questions in a bit, but why do you think there is so much misunderstanding around AI? You've touched upon, A, one, the metaphor of anthropomorphizing machines and, and B, the sort of like marketing side from, from companies that are developing AI. What do you, are those the main sources of misunderstanding? No, I actually I don't think so, although they of course, uh, marketers are very well motivated to try to make them so. Uh, but, but I do think it's fundamental to how we socialize that whenever we meet an entity that we think might be human, uh, then we start uh, playing sort of in-group, out-group games. We say, you know, do you speak English? <laughs> Things like that. And try to figure out, can, if, if you're a, a teenager, you say, what's your favorite band? You know, you immediately try to figure out how much can I trust this entity? And so I think when people are uh, encounter technology with which they can speak, of course they're going to play those games. Mm. Of course they're going to see. And they, but, the, but it all breaks down. So with a human, the fact that I'm spending this time talking to you really is an honest signal that, that I somehow value the time we have together and that, that we have something in common. But with a machine, uh, it, of course it doesn't matter it, it, how long it spends talking to you. So the person may feel confidence because the machine spent a lot of time at the beginning uh, you know, chatting about the weather or whatever, but in fact, it's only cost a tiny amount of electricity, it, you know, and to the corporation or whatever that that's uh, that that that's providing that that facility. Yeah, what do you make of some of these softwares that are designed now to emulate the speech of you know people that have passed away and people using oh. them to sort of try and reconnect in some way with someone that they love that has is no longer around, but through a machine that can emulate somehow their their speech. Yeah, so. This is a really interesting question. So actually, uh, going back to the question you asked before, that was actually my very first paper uh, mm. in uh, artificial intelligence. It was called Just Another Artifact mm -hmm. because uh, a colleague of mine, Phil Keim, and I were trying to understand why people were doing that over-identifying thing. Um, so, so coming back to the question you just asked me, um, the, uh, so the point of Just Another Artifact is that it is just another thing. It is just another machine, right? But we humans, a vast majority of humans, seriously believe that dead people have uh, concern about their behavior. And even those of us who like self-identify as atheists and naturalists and wouldn't believe that any supernatural entity could possibly have concerns about us, mm -hmm. we still are going to think sometimes like, oh, my grandpa wouldn't approve of that, you mm -hmm. know, something like that, mm -hmm. right? So there's a continuum that, that you know, there's been, the, you know, enormous rituals, huge sacrifices have been made to, to ancestors all before. So this isn't that new. Yet, the fact that you tell someone that, you know, when you had the, 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 the voice as well, I, I just worry about the number of people that will then invest massive resources thinking that somehow this is uh, benefiting their actual, their, their actual parents or grandparents or, or best friends or whatever. So um, I, I do think that these kinds of, sometimes these kinds of, obviously we've, we've survived 
uh, for, for, and maybe it's strengthened us and empowered us that we believe in uh, the efficacy of, of the dead. You know, so I'm not saying that we shouldn't have, people shouldn't have those beliefs, but at the same time, uh, uh, if you put too much time, if something can grab, capture a natural thing and then make you overinvest in it, then it's a way to strip resources from you, mm. and, you know, and, and that, can, that can lead to uh, impoverishment. Uh, I was for many years at the University of Bath here, and the University of Bath has a center for uh, death and society. And one of the things, actually it's similar for weddings, but also for funerals, the amount of resources that people, especially poor people, feel that they need to spend on a funeral, you know, and, and it's just it's just stripping money away from the most vulnerable, and uh, and it, and it does uh, increase inequality. We we touched, or you touched earlier, on some of the ethical kind of concerns that come out of artificial intelligence, and again, a lot of the time we focus on these kind of catastrophic futures where AI takes over and you know rules the world and, and rules over humans. What do you think are some of the more pressing and real kind of ethical challenges when it comes to AI? Yeah, I, I do. It's not really about, again, it's not about AI itself as much as that AI can facilitate this. Mm -hmm. But I do worry that there will be, uh, or there may even already be, autocrats that will create these kinds of AI versions of themselves and mm. then try to leave them power. Right. <laughs> you know? uh, so, so, but I think the real problem there is about inequality and uh, autocracy. And more generally, uh, it's not so much artificial intelligence itself as the digital revolution that, that you know, AI is literally the face of the digital revolution. Yeah. But there's a big question about can we stabilize democracy when we have so much information about each other because we are so good at selling each other things. And so hopefully we can, we just need to be creative. It is a project of the humanities and the social sciences and sociology and philosophy to construct a new stable web of people that, so that we can keep things on an even keel and we can create a, a sustainable society. But so far we haven't found that. And mm. I kind of think that autocracy is like weeds. You know, if you, disrupt, if you disrupt ground, then there's these plants that can move in very quickly and, 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 and they're very shallow rooted, but they, you know, and they're actually an essential part to stabilizing that ground and then the more rich ecosystem comes in. So I think that's where we are now, that, that we need to stabilize, what, but autocracy has moved in faster. But we have these, you know, I don't want to say existential problems. I think there'll still be people in, in mm. 10,000 or years. Yeah. But, but so you think the, the problems that arise from AI aren't to do with the technology itself necessarily, but just with the social conditions that exist at the moment that produce this kind of technology. Yeah. And Th This goes back to the anthropomorphism thing again. Mm. I, 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 you, you might want to blame the technology itself. Uh, and, and, you know, that probably you could get a PhD <laughs> showing how that's a good, reasonable way to talk mm. about it. But the only ones we can hold to account are the people who develop, own, and operate. Because our system of justice only works on other humans. And so I think it's essential that we consider, we look at it from that perspective. There are, I will name, uh, uh, who's his name? Uh, Pettit, Pettit and List. Had Pettit, a nice, Pettit, yeah. yeah, yeah. They have a nice... Uh, a uh, book talking about corporations as artificial intelligence. Mm. So that's, the, you know, if you do that, then you could say okay, the corporations are the actors and whatever. And, yeah. then, and then you might have a grip into the, the um, a human justice. You might get somewhere with that. But, but yeah, I don't think it makes sense to reason about the AI itself being the problem. So we obviously often focus on the negatives when it comes to AI. We're worried about all these ethical consequences. What are the positives that are coming out of this? Like, yeah. why are we building this technology and what can we expect from it? I, I, <laughs> I wouldn't be here except for Google Maps. I mean, right? right? I mean, we are all so much more productive. And that, again, is one of the questions because people, economists are not good at measuring that productivity. I can see in my day, and I have a pretty good memory, I remember how things used to be how much better we are at you know, grammar, at translation, at, at navigating, at purchasing, and fairness and justice. There's so many things that if we do communicate, we are empowering people. And then we create new problems. Like So by empowering a lot of people, then we suddenly have more migrants than we've ever had before, which is great. That's much better than having people starve to death. Mm -hmm. But it creates new challenges of not least sustainability, justice, stability, right? So... Um, I, it, you know, artificial intelligence is just, it's like writing. It's something that you could do bad things with and good things with. And, and I think we have to realize that we've been phenomenally successful. In fact, that's why one of the biggest challenges we have right now are the problems of an extremely su successful species, sustainability 
and pandemics are, are, are two of those things that come when you have so much success. Um, but I think we can use artificial intelligence to solve those kinds of problems, and people are. They're, they're in this moment, at least with the pandemic, we can't believe how fast we got to the vaccines we got. That was absolutely uh, AI augmenting the great work of great scientists who are working very hard. I don't want to say it was you know, the AI doing it, but mm. the tools they used were intelligent. And um, I, th I think we're also seeing that in politics, and hopefully we'll, we'll find good solutions to the, the greater questions. Okay, a final question going back to the theme of anthropomorphism, as it were. When we're designing AI, we, we often sort of look to human psychology, human cognition, trying to replicate it. We're trying to do the same with robots when we you know, develop them, we start making them look like humans. Do you think that's the wrong direction? We should be doing something different. Right. Well, again, I'm going to uh, go back <laughs> to what I did in the first couple of questions and, and challenge you a little bit about that. Like what I just mentioned, some of the most pervasive AI we see is like the the um, the spell checking, the the navigating, the 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 recommender systems, Amazon helping you find the things you want to buy, whatever. All that AI is not even remotely human-like, mm. and and it's that's the vast majority of the AI. So the subset that we call again, as I say, it's the part of the digital revolution that that that, that has a face on it that we that we identify with that tiny subset. Should, should we be building that? That's a really interesting ethical question. So originally I was doing it, as I said, I, I, my PhD was in building human-like intelligence, making it easier to build that, um, because I was a scientist, because I wanted to understand human-like intelligence. And that's the excuse we, a lot of us use it. Now some people are saying we need to do this because some people are lonely and it helps them not be lonely, um, for example. Yeah. And, uh, there's a real question about that because uh, it's like every other like form of welfare that, that um, yes, some people cannot you know hang out with other people in the same way. On the other hand, if they some people if they force themselves out a little more would help hold society together better. Mm. So that's an interesting question. And then the other side of it is we are so social that we um, we automatically update and change our behavior if there's humans around us. We we conform. If a lot of the things that appear to be humans around us are, again, owned by uh, corporations or governments, they can channel us and change who we are. So I am aware of people who believe there is no moral way to have natural language processing in the home. And these were not people that started out that way. These are just technologists that worked in companies, but were trying to make sure that they were trying to find ways to ameliorate, um, sorry, to, to reduce the kinds of problems they have from people talking to, you know, Alexa or something mm. like that in their mm. house. And they came to the conclusion, there's no way to do it. We will definitely change the culture of the household if these tools are inside of it, because language matters that much to people. Mm. John Bryson, thank you very much. Well, thank you. <laughs>